Today we are here to do, uh, to talk about self-determination. And we're gonna get started because today we are uh, talking about the independent facilitator. And we have some amazing independent facilitators who have agreed to, to have a dialogue with me today about what is the role of an independent facilitator. So um, we're gonna start with Molly Kennedy, who's from our staff. Um, and I will do a quick presentation on what is an independent facilitator for those of you who may not completely understand the role, and then we'll start the dialogue. So let me just get our little slideshow started, and I will share screen. Uh, make sure I have the right screen. I always ask Ed or I'm seeing Sunny's face right now. Sunny, are you just seeing my slideshow right now? You're not seeing my entire desktop. Excellent. I made that mistake once and that was bad. Um, okay, so um, this is about the role of the independent facilitator. Thank you all for coming. Oh, I should, before I get started, I didn't finish saying earlier that we have the recordings of all of our, um, of all of our uh, SDP connects on something called the interchange, um, the interchange.org. Um, we have two of them, we're about to build a third. Um, so go to the one on self-determination and go to SDP Connect and you can find the recordings of our 35 or so previous SDP Connects. Okay, so what is an independent facilitator? Well, it's not something random, it's actually written in statute. Um, that is very, very clear. And here's the way that our law talks about what an independent facilitator does. So first they assist the individual, the participant in the self-determination program and their family with making informed decisions about their individual budget. So remember the individual budget is the amount of money you have to spend on your self-determination program. And they help you figure out how much that might be and act to advocate for you. Um, they help you locate, um, access and coordinate the services and supports that are consistent with your IPP. Um, and we talked a lot about that last, uh, a few weeks ago, we've taken a couple week break, but I remember we were talking about services supports and your spending plan a couple of weeks ago. They also help you identify your immediate needs um, and also your long-term needs. So it might be that your immediate needs are you have a health issue. And so you want to, to address those health issues, but long-term, maybe you want to get a job or maybe you want to get married. And so you have goals that will, that will lead you towards your long-term goals, as well as goals that, that address your immediate needs. They also help you lead, participate, and they advocate for you in the person-centered planning process. So many of you think that the only thing that an IF does, an independent facilitator does, is to uh, help you with your person-centered planning meeting, but that's not the case. They have a very, very broad uh, set of responsibilities. Um, and um, by the way, because I think we missed this in the, in the chat, you don't have to have just one independent facilitator. You can have many independent facilitators. You could have one that leads your person-centered planning, another one that helps you identify services and activities and items in your spending plan, and even another one to help you manage your workers over time or to help advocate for you at your meeting. You can have many independent facilitators. Um, and, and obviously a big one that's so important is helping you think about services and supports in your community to access. So what are the requirements to be an independent facilitator? Well, um, that is also laid out very clearly in the self-determination law. Um, they have to have received training. Um, so that's important when you're selecting a person. Um, and, but it's in the following areas. Number one, the principles of the self-determination program, that's critical. Um, and then um, secondly, they have to learn about the person-centered planning process. 
and also about their roles and responsibilities of the independent facilitator. You may ask, where does a person get this training? There's a lot of training that exists out there. Um, and uh, I know that there's trainings being sponsored by state, local, regional offices of the state council, local advisory committees at regional centers are sponsoring trainings, Autism Society of LA are sponsoring trainings. So there's a lot of, of trainings going on out there. Um, and then I just want to add that there was, there was uh, something passed in, in, into law on July 1st, so just recently, that is now going to require independent facilitators to receive some kind of certification. Um, we don't know what that looks like yet. You can continue to hire a person with, with, to, to do it who doesn't have a certificate. You want to make sure they have received that training. Um, I'm assuming we'll know in the next couple of months what that certification looks like. And I'm assuming that most people have already taken enough training where they, they've got, they'll be able to get that certification by just showing proof that they've done that, cert, that, the, that kind of training. Um, I'm going to throw this over to Molly. Do you want to do this one? Yeah. So to be clear, you get to hire the individual as long as they're trained and they're um, somewhat certified, like they've been through training, but there are some criteria where you cannot be a facilitator. And this is first, if you provide services to the principal participant pursuing his or her IPP in self-determination. So if you work for an agency that provides you support, you can't be a, a individual uh, IF for that person. Um, they need to be employed by a person or agency that provides services to the participant. So they can't be a person employed by an agency. Maybe you have a great independent skill person that really knows you but they're being paid to provide you services and they cannot um, be a facilitator. A parent of a minor, so if you have a child under 18, you cannot be a facilitator. And then if you're married to someone, um, they cannot be a facilitator. And really, these are because there's already a relationship there, and there could be conflicts of interest, or, you know, if they're already providing services, they might be nudging you to add to their budget or whatever. So in the, in the directives, these are the people who can't be independent facilitators. Thank you. Um, all right, so moving along. So, so um, I, I want to point out something that I believe is very controversial related to this. And that is that on the first bullet where it says a person who is providing other services to the participant pursuant to his or her IVP, the D Department of Developmental Services, the state of California has included in that list uh, if you are the person's IHSS worker, even though IHSS is not paid for through the regional center. And I think that's ridiculous because IHSS is not pursuant to a person's IVP. Um, I think it's really a problem, and I'm, I'm hoping at some point that we can really challenge that. All right, who hires the independent facilitator? Why don't you take this one too, Molly? So, um, 
The individual in the family that are pursuing going into self-determination, they hire the individual to be their um, independent facilitator. It's not that we do not know that says you have to hire so and so. You can hire anyone that meets the criteria. Now, when you do hire someone, you want them to, to hire, you want them to know what services that they want. And uh, so if I was hiring, I would want them to know what I need and how I need it. Um, I would decide if I needed more than one facilitator. Maybe I have one that's really great at goals and person-centered planning, but they're not great at budget. So I hire someone who is doing my budget separately. And how much I pay the individual is a, it's a negotiation. There is no set rate for independent facilitator. So, you know, it's up to what you think you want to pay in negotiating with the person you are considering to hire. Thank you. All right, so how do you pick someone? So we're gonna go through some creative ways to do that. So most importantly, you need to pick someone you feel comfortable with. No one should tell you, oh, you have to have that person. Your regional center shouldn't be telling you who to pick. Your friends shouldn't be telling you to, who to pick. You should interview a few people, figure out who you connect with and who you're comfortable with. You want to make sure that they have an in-depth understanding of the self-determination program. And, and let me just make a note that not everybody is going to have a lot of experience yet because it's a pretty new program. So you might be getting someone who's learning because a lot of us are learning together here. Um, the, I, I've always said that it's so important that they show that they understand your needs, but also that they understand your community. So. Um, you know, I'll give an example. So for my sons, my son is in the self-determination program and we hired a person out of state to do his person center planning, lives in another state who's really, really amazing. One of the best in the country on person center planning. So she led the person center plan, but she couldn't possibly identify the services and supports. She also doesn't know the sort of rules and regulations of the self-determination program. So, so we had someone else help us with that. So you might want to, you want to make sure that, but, but this person that we hired understands us, knows our family and knows our needs, knows our needs well, okay? Um, the independent facilitator, remember, does not need to be a vendor. If your regional center is coming back to you and saying, wow, they're not a vendor, they don't need to be. There is some paperwork that does need to be filled out. You need to submit some tax. The independent facilitator needs to submit some tax stuff, some basic, you know, the contact information. But if they're having the independent facilitator fill out a 30 page document that with all this kind of insurance and liability insurance, it's, that's just not needed and actually not required. And you should be having them push back. So people always say, where do I find a list of independent facilitators? And if any of you have ever been on the STP Connect or know me at all, you'll know how much I hate lists. I hate lists because we have been programmed our whole life to choose from a list. You know, we go to the regional center, we get, uh, okay, you are approved for support living or, or our day program. And here's three that you can choose from. And that's just not the way self-determination works there. So I'm, I'm um, philosophically opposed to lists. However, I want to make it clear that there are a lot of lists out there and people are providing lists. Um, sometimes regional centers have lists. Sometimes 
Um, I know that there's a website that one of the FMSs has created that has right now 75 uh, independent facilitators on there. I was looking through it yesterday and it's quite overwhelming actually. And it's very hard to tell on this list who to select just based on it. Um, there is also, um, your, I think one of the great ways to pick someone is to start going to your local advisory committee meetings because there's a set of um, independent facilitators who go to those meetings um, and they speak up and they know your regional center. So not only do you want to make sure they're comfortable with you, but they know how to negotiate on your behalf and advocate for you at your regional center. Unfortunately, each regional center is implementing self-determination differently. It, it, it ends up being a mishmash and, and very unequal. But you know, you don't want to be hiring a person. If you live in San Diego, you may not want to hire a person who works in, in uh, Golden Gate Regional Center who's never interacted with anybody at the San Diego Regional Center who may not be able to be the best advocate for you. Um, a lot of local advisory committees and regional centers are holding resource fairs. And at those resource fairs, independent facilitators may have a, a booth. I mean, a lot of these are now virtual, but they'll have a virtual booth and you can go and meet them and then maybe follow up with conversations. We have um, something called the STP interchange, which I've mentioned in there. There's a section on independent facilitators. You can go in there and see how some of them are talking. Um, and then the last piece is if you, if you have someone in your life who you think knows you and your community well, who you think would make a great independent facilitator for you, uh, an idea is to have them um, become certified or have them go through the training. Uh, the trainings are being offered all over the place. Um, some cases there's a small charge, but in many cases they're completely free. Um, and have them go through this training and then they can become your independent facilitator. Because no one who you meet at a resource fair is going to know you as well as someone who's been part of your life. Um, I also want to mention um, something to the parents out there. I have seen parents say that they know their child the best, and so they should be their, they are going to be their child's independent facilitator. Um, and, I'm, and they're not even talking about getting paid to be their facilitator. It's not even about the money. It's that they're doing the person-centered plan without having a person-centered planning meeting, without putting the person in the center of it. Um, and I personally am going to say it's a terrible idea. Um, I'm not going to say it's always a bad idea, but for the initial time when you're going into the program, you want to have an outside person help you with this. I'm about as an ex good an expert as you can find on, on the self-determination program. And I still had an outside person do my lead my son's person-centered plan. Because sitting around at his meeting, I wanted to be his mom. I just wanted to be there as mom. My son has had three person-centered plans, um, big ones. We had 25 people at one of them at a restaurant pre-COVID. We've had him in my, our living room. We've had my son's favorite food. They've been so great but I have not been in charge. I have sat there, I've listened to people's ideas, I've taken it all in, and I've been an unbiased participant. And so that, that is really, really critical for you to, uh, to think about. So parents who are out there writing the person center plan, you have money to do it. It's not like, oh, I don't wanna spend money. There is money to do it, and you're gonna hear that in a moment. So I'm not gonna go through all of these, but I want you to know, hold on, I'm gonna get them all up on the screen. Um, I want, oops, I'll go back. Um, I want you to know that in the orientation, um, which I helped to produce this part of the orientation, there is a set of questions that you can ask prospective independent facilitators. Not all of them are pertinent to you. Some of them may be inappropriate for you to ask, but, if you don't know, like, what do I say? There's a whole page of questions. And just also, there's a whole page of questions you should ask the FMSs. And there's a whole page of questions that you should be asking service providers. There's a sample agreement that you can have with your service providers and your independent facilitator. So I encourage you to go through this whole thing. So I'm just going to highlight a, a couple. Um, Obviously you want to know like how many person-centered plans they've done, 
you know, what has been their experience as an independent facilitator. But some of the questions, I mean, that seems to be where people stop, but you want to say, are you aware of activities in my area that I can be interested in? Because if this person is in Northern California and you live in Southern California, they may have no clue where to find a good karate place or no clue where to find, um, you know, potential staff. They don't know what colleges or universities exist. So think about local people who are gonna know your community. Um, you may also wanna look at them um, about help about this second phase, which is creating your, you know, advocating for you at your budget, uh, for your budget at your IPP, advocating for you to, um, for your spending plan, figuring out your spending plan. You might want to ask them how they go about doing that. What's their strategy? You can also have an independent facilitator do things once you get into the self-determination program, such as be your advocate at the, at the school IEP um, to help you get benefits such as IHS S or SSI. You can also um, uh, use an independent facilitator to help manage your workers. If you're an adult and you live on your own and you may have eight workers coming in and out and there's you know, a lot of scheduling issues or maybe you don't wanna have to be their manager and tell them when they're not doing a good job, you can hire an independent facilitator to do that as well. Um, all right, now let's go over all these directives that Molly helped me get onto slides. So there's been four, I believe, four or five, what's called a directive, which is um, information that the state <laughs> Department of Developmental Services puts out to the regional centers um, and tells them this is, we're directing you to do it this way. Um, and so um, this is the, this is one of the original ones that came out. And it says, um, there was actually one before, there was one before this, um, which is from 2018. Right. And the one from 20, do, do we, I can't even remember if we have a slide on the 2018 We, one. those were the first slide. Okay, yeah. right, right. Okay, so in 2018, the original directive on the self-determination program laid out all of those responsibilities, like can advocate for you, can help identify services and supports. All those things, that, that comes straight from the law, and that was the directive, that, the very first directive. So you have to remember all that. So in, in February of 2019, they said, they, they, DDS said that for people entering the program for the first time, they can request services, uh, so funding for person-centered planning services and transition services to move into the self-determination program, which will not come out of your budget. And so um, that is really important. And that funding was originally made available for the phase-in participants, but now it is made available to all people who are moving into the program. So regional centers are able to purchase for you this, these initial services. They don't call them independent facilitators. They call them person-centered planning services. And so it doesn't really matter. Um, they're, they're basically the same people who are doing it once you're in the program or moving in for the first time. Remember that they don't have to, they can be vendor providers, they can, you know, traditional service providers, they can be people who don't have a contract, people or organizations. Um, and the way you ask for this funding is you go to your service coordinator and you say, I want, um, I want funding for a person center planning services and transition services into the SDP. The service code is called 024. And you should, first of all, you should find your independent facilitator first, and then say, this is the person I'm gonna be using and here is their contact information. And then what should happen is the, is the service coordinator will get the information from your independent facilitator to, to make sure that they get paid. Um, which is critically important. So then they issued another directive on September 3rd of 2019 to clarify things because regional centers um, literally need handholding to understand how to implement all these things. And not all of them do. There's some regional centers who went right ahead and implemented this and others who really had to, um, needed this extra direction. 
And so this, what this directive says is that you um, payment may be made to a service provider vendored. I know it says vendored, but they're not true vendors under the service code. Um, only after the regional center receives the following an invoice from your independent facilitator um, that showing that they finished the person center planning or a certain phase of the person center planning services. And then a copy of that person center plan must be provided um, to the regional center in order to get um, in order to get uh, payment. Um, I'm I, you guys all don't need to be so concerned about it. Believe me, the independent facilitators have their own network and they sit and complain about this stuff all the time. Um, so, but from but you need to know that this is the way they can get paid. Then they issued yet another directive where they clarified them both. Um, and this is a year later. Um, and what it says is, is that when they are, um, they, when they are purchasing these services, the initial, the, before you go in through the 024 funds, that they may include payments to facilitators who are carrying out any of the roles. And the reason why this had to be clarified is because there are independent facilitators who were going to people's IPPs to help advocate for them. And there were some regional centers who were saying, we're not gonna pay for your time here at the IPP. And so this makes it very clear that any kind of advocacy that the independent facilitator does, including up until and through a fair hearing process, because that's part of the IPP process, you should be able to, the, you should be able to get your independent facilitator paid for that up to $2,500 and not to exceed the $2,500, okay? Now, if you're already in the self-determination program, you can have a budget line item to pay for your independent facilitator to also do any of the roles and responsibilities that were written in that very first directive. The final directive just came out last uh, month and a half ago, uh, two months ago now, and it basically said, clarified that People going in now that the program is statewide, all of those people can get access to these this twenty five hundred dollars up to twenty five hundred dollars in person center planning and transition services. Um, it also um, said that regional center service coordinators are supposed to be assisting people in their transition, and remember they should be assisting you in your language, in plain language, in ways that support you that are culturally humble to you. Okay. Um, that regional centers are supposed to work with their local volunteer advisory committees to arrange for people to help for these planning services, and that funding will be available um, for regional centers to add um, 90, 60, sorry, 60 participant choice specialists, specialists throughout the state who will be in charge of the self-determination program at the regional center. All right, so we now um, are going to, did I miss anything, Molly? All right, nope. we're now, we're now going to move to, um, I know that there were a few questions that came up, but I think I, I want to have some of the facilitators actually, I'm going to, here's who we have. Let me introduce them all. Um, and then we're going to go to um, some questions and, and have a little discussion, and then we'll get to all of your questions. So um, I want to thank uh, these wonderful six um, independent facilitators from around the state. We have Jinsit Bach, who's from Being Built Together. It's an organization that is specifically targeting the, the Korean speaking community. Um, we have Dusty Beavers from First Choice Solutions. Dusty has been an independent facilitator for over 20 years and, and has been helping people through the pilot. For those of you who may not know, self-determination was around for many, many years since 1998 in five regional centers to test out the program. Sunny Charness from Guidelight Group, um, who is a wonderful agency in Southern California, although I'm sure you work throughout the state. Um, Tracy Evanson from Life Coaching. Tracy is a, a newer um, person, a newer independent facilitator, which I think is so awesome. We have a shortage of independent facilitators in our state. And so I want to show that there are new people coming in and getting great experience. Uh, what the thing I love about Tracy is she comes to her SVP Connects 
she's super active in, and she's and she is now a, she may not think she's a super experienced one but she's way more experienced than the people who don't come to our stp connects so we'll put it like that um carla lehman from exceptional connections um carla um uh, is fluent in spanish and in english and serves all different kinds of of individuals in the self-determination program, but but can definitely support families who speak, um, who have a need for Spanish speaking. And then there's Doug Paskover, one of the earliest of the um, independent facilitators from Imagine um, in, in uh, the Santa Cruz area, who um, is my go-to guy whenever I have a question about independent facilitation. And I, I love Doug, but I mostly like his children. Um, okay, so um, stop sharing so that I can actually get my list of um, questions that I have. So thank you, independent facilitators, for coming. I so appreciate it. Let me get my uh, questions up to uh, so that I can ask you. So first of all, let me let me shoot this question out to um, to. Doug, let me start with you, Doug. Um, Doug, what what should, because I know, so you should know that Doug, this is not what he does full time. He actually runs a big supportive living agency. So he's like the person with the most probably distance from, from, from the self-determination program or from, the, from the, the job as an independent facilitator. What is your advice to people who are looking for a self, uh, an independent facilitator? My, my first advice is to do a good critical self look about what parts of running your own program are going to be difficult for you and look for an independent facilitator who has those skills. Give I, I've heard you say this before it's a brilliant concept will you give an example of that. Yeah, uh, well, so I, a lot of times, um, and I'll say hi to my friend Linda because she's also my niece's friend. I use my niece as an example, you know, she's got a mom who's a great advocate with the regional center and she's got an uncle Doug with a lot of experience in program development. Um, so she, her circle of support will cover those things, but I, um, but neither of her parents have had in their work life, the responsibility of supervising people. So she might want an independent facilitator who had been a manager and had a lot of experience there. Um, someone else might be very new and nervous station and want somebody like Dusty, who's been a service coordinator or Sonny, who has developed a school and a firm. And, um, and I don't, let me include everybody, but um, on, on the circle. So it, it's really a matter of what do you think you're going to need the most help with and, mm -hmm. and look for a person who offers that. That's great. Um, so um, I'm going to throw this to Dusty because she's our second most experienced person here. Um, so Dusty, when people are looking for their independent facilitator, um, should they be asking them? So, so let's say we're going, we're taking Doug's advice, and we're saying, okay, I know I'm, I, I'm going to have somebody do person-centered planning, but I really know the community well. I'm the mom. I can really go out and identify the services and supports. I know where the great community programs are, but I don't know how to budget. Like I can't do a spending plan. I mean, how do people ask those kinds of questions? Do how how would they approach that? No, you bring up a really good point. Um, it, I think that in in your your book, right, thinking outside the box, you guys listed a lot of good important questions, and I think you know, with, to Doug's point, kind of that self reflection too of okay, I know I'm really good at finding the things that my child needs or finding the things my brother needs, for example, but putting all the pieces together, I just don't have time. So when I'm interviewing that independent facilitator, I'm going to be asking those questions. You know, if I need you to develop a budget, are you comfortable with that? Or I mean, a spending plan, are you comfortable with that? And if it's like, eh, numbers really aren't my thing, then that may be, you know, uh, maybe a red flag that that person may not be able to fit my needs. Or if you go, you know, gosh, I have all these great ideas, but I, I just need help putting them, you know, down in paper or making it, you know, 
presentable. Um, and if the person goes, gosh, you know, I really think you should be looking somewhere else uh, for, for activities, or I think your child needs this, then maybe that person might not be a good fit, right? You want that person who's willing to work with you and, and what you're gonna bring to the table too as a team member. So I think that my, my ultimate point is, as you're interviewing independent facilitators, could you see yourself working with that person and can you work with them as part of a team? Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. A very good suggestion. Um, so let me let me ask this to Jin Sook. Yeah. So Jin Sook, um, you have a very particular um, community that you're serving. Um, but uh, you know what kind of experience should a person have? not only the kind of experience having person center plan, um, writing person center plans, but what kind of experience should people have in a community uh, that they're trying to serve those individuals? Um, as you said, uh, we have a special um, com community um, and we work together. But um, so, so we need to, I think uh, I have a should have a, uh, the perspective of um, what they really need and what they try to avoid, or um, so, and, and they have uh, we have our own culture. So in our culture, um, so their perspective to see the uh, person sent a self determination program, or and, and also the to see the system of the traditional system. So we need to see the, uh, to figure out the what is the weak, uh, weak point and the strong point. So we can uh, adjust in between the, their families and the, the new system. So we can encourage them to change their perspective to new system. So I, we wanted to uh, play a role in between that. Right, and and I want to I want to re ask the question because it wasn't I didn't it, it wasn't I didn't make it clear to you. What I'm asking is, so you work with the Korean community, um, and and what is it about your those services you provide that makes you a better independent facilitator for a, a Korean family than if they wanted to just hire any other person who maybe doesn't speak Korean? Of course. Um... Um, they, I, we want to, we need to provide the services in our language and, you know, uh, in our special culture so that they can access, they can approach a self-determination program more effectively and easily so that we, um, most of all, we need to uh, have a good understanding of the culture and the provide the services in our, their preferred language. That's, that's very helpful. I'm going to throw a similar question to Tracy. So Tracy, you know, for, for, for um, participants who uh, maybe have been traditionally underserved um, or it's underserved in the traditional system, I should say, um, or who, who have a very specific culture that they come from, you know, what is your advice to, to these participants in trying to find uh, an independent facilitator who, who can really understand their family and be culturally humble, all those kinds of things? For myself, um, I, I was one of those families. I went probably more than 10 years without accessing regional center services um, for my daughter. And it was just because I felt like I had mastered it on my own because it was so hard to access those services um, on my own because it, they didn't apply to me. I mean, we couldn't access them based on what was available, based on the, you know, the in the box services. Um, this is what's available. It didn't, it wasn't feasible for me at the time to access those services. So I didn't realize it was disparity at that time. It was just, that wasn't available. Let me just figure out another way to meet my daughter's needs. And, and we, and we figure it out on our own. And now I realize, you know, what truly what disparity is, if that 
organization doesn't work for you, you find another one, you find one that works on night at, you know, at nights, you find one that's available on weekends. It's just, you know, for me to get services, I had to take time off of work. I had to lose income. I had to um, do a lot. And so now that I realize the disparity factor and how real it is, um, it, just what you mentioned, attending all of these trainings, learning everything. I go to community meetings, I go to vendor meetings, I go to um, advisory board meetings, and I just learn everything that's in the community and, and then build the trust and the rapport um, with um, the African-American community in, the, in, in those conversations by attending support groups mm -hmm. and letting them know and trying to bridge that gap. I mean, the regional center is our source of services that we should have available to be able to tap into. Now, if you need to learn how to navigate that, um, I, I mean, I've had parents who have said things like it, it, they've compared the accessing services from the regional center is the same as like a domestic violence relationship, mm -hmm. which I'm a domestic violence advocate and have been one for over 10 years. So just serving the oppressed communities is just something that I love to do. And, but when, when that one mom said that to me, just to convince her that I can help her access those services because I understand now what disparity is and mm -hmm. how you don't just take no, you know, we, we can't, this is what you have to choose from. And it doesn't meet your, it's not, you know, um, conducive with your family and your lifestyle. And, 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 and that's just, that's not the end. You don't have to just walk away and not get services. And now that I know this, um, that's how I feel I can contribute to the community and helping them access services. No, 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 no. That is the problem. There is another way. Now we have this self-determination. They don't have to be vendored. You can hire someone else. We can look outside the box. Mm -hmm. You have other options. It's truly a freedom opportunity for our clients who have gone without services because we weren't able to access them in that box that was given to us. Thank you. Excellent. Um, Carla, um, what do you say to participants um, who are looking for an independent facilitator, but they um, maybe they have been traditionally underserved, or maybe they are a child who has smaller needs, but they have a very small budget. How can an independent facilitator help someone with a small budget? Yes, I think this is one of my big expertise because I work with a lot of clients that are having the same issues as Tracy was saying, and maybe they're monolingual, they don't know how to express their needs, or they don't even know what services are in the community uh, or in the regional center. Um, so in, in my experience and IF, what it can do is, is identify those unmet needs and they, they come like in the pre-planning, when you do the person-centered plan, a lot of, of these unmet needs are coming or changes in circumstances. And the IF would go with you to the regional center or uh, even before going to the budget meeting or in the budget meeting and advocate for you and advocate for these services. And, and even when they say no, believe me, I was there, they have to fight for you. They, they fight, they fight until those needs are met. Um, so don't worry about having a small budget because that's what we're here for. The IAVs are here to help you and guide you and support you. And so you don't stress out about it. And, and we are the ones helping you about it. So even if with a small budget, just do it because then you're gonna see the benefits in self-determination. You're gonna see how you can help your child or help yourself get those services that you were not able to access before. Thank you, Carla. I've been saving this question for Sunny because I go to Sunny with this question a lot. Um, what are some of the greatest challenges you've seen in the self-determination program as an independent facilitator? Oh boy, that and is. We a, only have we only have like forty <laughs> minutes left. <laughs> um, with getting people into the program or or ongoing. Yeah, let's say let's start with getting people into the program. Um, I would have to say the biggest challenge that um I think people experience is that each regional center right now is doing things their own way. And that makes it really hard for um, for us for for the community for us as a community 
um, a community of um, people using services from the regional center, a community of IEFs, but just as the community as a whole to learn from one another because you have such different experiences at different regional centers. Um, and that's really challenging. And sometimes it can feel like the rules change on you. Like it, this, this was the rule at one point and now all of a sudden things are happening differently. Um, so I think that that um, is one of the biggest challenges. And then kind of that's like on a macro level, a, a, a big level. Then there's also a lot of challenges on a very micro level, things that you wouldn't even quite, that might not even make sense to you until you're in it. But things like um, the logistics of how to put together a spending plan and one one FMS calculates something one way and another one calculates it another way or um, so there are kind of big picture things and then there are also smaller things. Um, and we are all learning together, regional centers included. Um, you know, I don't like to give them so much leeway to, to say that they're learning because it's like, okay, well, learn. <laughs> um, but, but, um, but things are kind of evolving and that, that, that can be challenging. Um, and then once people are in the program, we're still uncovering sometimes what those, what the challenges are, because like we've, we've um, not all of our clients at Guideline Group have gone through the transition yet from their first year to their second year. And every time we do that, we're sort of uncovering little technical issues that we have to address. Um, so those, those for us have been some of the biggest challenges with the program as, as a whole. Um, and then COVID, of course, had a whole set of challenges. COVID has additional challenges. Yeah. All right, I have a few more questions, but I, what I'd like to do is stop right now and take questions from the audience because they're for you guys. Um, so we're going to start with Linda chan Rap. Are you there, Linda, to be able? I'm going to ask you to unmute. Hi, <clears throat> I appreciate you letting me ask my question. My first question, and I wrote it in the chat, was for Jinsuk. Hi, Jinsuk. Um, what cultural values and priorities should independent facilitators understand um, who are supporting families in the Korean speaking community? And to generalize that question, um, to anyone who's working with other other people from different cultural or linguistic backgrounds, what um, values and priorities would it be helpful to understand to help support, better support people coming from those, those backgrounds? I think um, the, the Korean culture is um, is a little special, and um, they, um, of course, I mean not all Korean people, but uh, most people they open their mind to the people who have a, a deep trust. So, um, so before I mean because I mean thanks to our uh, experience with Korean families through the uh, Korean Parent Support Group, we have a lot of uh, the good relationships so that um, we can, um, it's, it's uh, easier for us to approach uh, that uh, families and um, to, um, when we um, talk about um, the children's um, um, dream and hopes, then uh, we, um, we can based on the the based on the the relationship and trust, so we can um, um, gradually op uh, uh, help them to open their mind. So, um, so that is the most of uh, most priority things we uh, before we start the self determination program, and um, so uh, it's. Uh, in, in our culture, I think it's not easy for them to, um, I don't know the other uh, the cultures, but um, to let uh, their uh, children to participate in this type of meeting. 
it's a self-determination meeting um, so, so that they uh, can uh, express their feelings or, or their interest and um, what they want. So it's not, it's not common. It's not common to, uh, to have that kind of conversation. So, so IF, I think as IF can um, to, 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 to pull that, um, the, um, the moments and um, to encourage them to express their feelings and um, you know their interest and even sometimes they they they, they can share their weakness but um, we we um, IFs can listen to them and carefully and so so make them feel more comfortable that that is the more important and so we try to put the priority. Thank you, Jin so, You know, and I think just to add on to that, I think it's really important um, for all of us who work in this field to have what's called, what I call cultural humility. And so there's cultural sensitivity that we've heard about, but that's different than being humble. Um, and when, what it means to be humble is that you're not the expert and you don't know everything. Um, so you may be a highly experienced independent facilitator um, or a regional center staff or a service provider, but that doesn't mean you know everything. And, um, and, that, and you can't possibly be person-centered if you come into this by saying, I know it all and you're doing it wrong. And so it's really, really important to, to be sensitive to the culture that this person comes from. And it's not just an ethnic culture or a language culture. There are cultures and families. There may be a multi-generational family. There may be cultures of religion. Um, there may be cultures of rural versus urban. And so you have to really be, you have to look for an independent facilitator who's gonna really understand not only your culture, but to be humble before it and to not, um, and to not uh, you know, believe that they know it all. Um, I'm gonna turn now to Harvey and Connie. I don't know which one of you had the question or maybe it's both of you. It's Harvey. Go ahead, yeah. Harvey. Hi, how are you doing? Listen, one of the things, and I'm sure the facilitators all know this, we're all used to one-stop shopping. Go to the regional center, even if it's a, a, a service that you can't get in a traditional system, but it's vendored another way. You don't have to be vendored, number one. Number two, in thinking out of the box, free, use the word free. What doesn't cost any money? Uh, you have a friend that has a horse, okay? Won't cost you, ask your friend. My kid wants to go on a horse. You have clubs out there. Socialization has always been an issue for our people. Uh, maybe this is way we break into the community. You, join a club. It's been done before in lots of other states. Unfortunately, I love the Lanterman Act, but I'm going to make a statement. It got us used to going just to the regional center. I know I was there at the beginning. Now we have to figure a way to reduce costs and it will be community, period. Thank you. Thanks, I'll say I'll say amen. Amen. It's a religious, <laughs> it's a religious experience. Yeah. <laughs> For those of you who don't know Connie and Harvey, they are the reason why we have the self-determination law in California. So they, they always get to ask and speak at all of these things. Um, okay, I'm gonna turn. There's been a ton of questions in the chat, um, some of them through private messaging to Ed. And so Ed, I'm gonna go to you to get some of the questions out. Certainly, Judy, just one second. Sorry, I wanna make sure that I'm visible on this. All right, so I have a question from Beth. Can I hire someone as a ticket broker to purchase time sensitive and specific tickets for theater, et cetera, and then bill our SDP uh, for the service plus cost of tickets? Um. Does any of the IFs want to take this? You can just unmute and, and speak. Dusty, that was you. Go ahead. I, I can take it. Um, we have been creative like that. Yes. Yep. 
we have been creative like that. Um, so, you know, I mean, you guys, what, what I've learned as, as an independent facilitator is so many of you already have the answers to your own questions, right? You've come up with amazing ideas. And, and I see my role as an independent facilitator is just to kind of give you the confidence to make your idea happen or um, help take your awesome idea and, and make it comply with the rules and regulations. Um, so, so yeah. I think Beth just raised her hand. So maybe she has a follow-up. Go ahead, Beth. Yeah, I did. I'm having trouble getting my FMS to put through any purchases whatsoever, much less anything time sensitive. So like my son goes to Disney on ice, but he has to sit in a certain place in the theater. So like when those tickets come available, they have to be purchased three seconds after they come available. Um, so I'm struggling with trying to find a path that will succeed. This year, I just paid out of pocket again. Um, but I was wondering if I could um, hire my daughter to be the person who purchases all the tickets and then just bills my son through um, through SDP. I'm assuming I can't since I'm his IHSS provider. Um, yeah, so here's what I would say because I've been part of a work group um, that I believe Doug is also part of um, that has been looking at uh, working with the Department of Developmental Services on issuing a directive of what you're allowed to purchase and what you're not allowed to purchase. Um, I, are you on that work group, Doug? I feel like you're, oh, well, you're supposed to be. That's right. There's not a single independent facilitator on that work group. Forgot about that. We're, it's really completely outrageous. Um, so hopefully you'll be on it at some point. But um, uh, here is what I can tell you. Um, so to hire a person to purchase tickets, first of all, I would never call them a ticket broker. Like that is not going to fly with a regional center. You should be calling them a community integrator. Okay. You are, they are helping you access community activities. Gotcha. Um, and they should be doing more than purchasing tickets. I mean, there's, there's a lot more to do in the world in the community right. than going to, you know, shows and theater and stuff. Right. Um, but they should be doing lots of things. So in my son's spending plan, we call that person an independent facilitator. And that independent facilitator is not only helping access activities, but also helping calling up my son's friends and saying, oh, Josh wants to go to this activity. Is that an activity you want to go to with him? Mm -hmm. And then together we'll purchase the tickets. Now, speaking of tickets, I think that um, in the foreseeable future, that it is going to be more of a challenge to get those tickets paid for through the self-determination program that are not related to the person's disability. So what is related to the person's disability is you need someone to make sure that they have a special seat at a show that they want to go to. That's clearly right. related to their disability. But what is not related to their disability is that they go to Disney and Ice. Right. And so uh, I, I'm not saying don't try. And I think that some people have gotten this stuff through, and that includes Disneyland tickets and Universal Studios tickets. Some people have gotten that stuff through. But I have a feeling that purely at pure entertainment that is accessible to all people, regardless of disability, is going to potentially be off the table in the coming months. So, um, and right now, regional centers are taking it upon themselves to already say you can't do that. Um, what about for the aid, though? Like he can't um, go alone. He has to have someone go with right. him. Right. So certainly they would pay the salary of the aid to go. What is unclear is where DDS is going to come out with having the AIDS ticket paid for. I think it's a completely reasonable request to have the ticket because it's not like an aide is going to want to on their own go to Disney on ice, right? right. So it's, I mean, it's clearly because of them supporting that individual. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is um, a, a different topic. And I think, you know, I'm going to continue to advocate. We meet on the last Friday of every month. So I guess it'll be next Friday that we're meeting. Um, and I will continue to har harass them on this and figure out when we're awesome. gonna get this direction. Thank you. And it can't be a person providing IHSS, correct? The ticket yes. or the community integrator, or it can't? Oh, oh, oh right. So the IHSS person at this point may not be able to be the, the independent facilitator. So if, if, if you're talking about a person being an IHSS worker, then I would not call them a facilitator. I'd call them a community integrator. Okay, but they could. So yeah. like, 
I have a back, which was my second question, Ed, you don't have to ask it then. Um, so I have a woman that I bought a house with and she's not related, but she's my backup provider for my son on IHSS, which means she's only helping out when I'm unable to. So I would be able to hire her as a community integrator to Absolutely. do tickets and, and things right. like that. Okay. Yes. Judy, okay. I do want to say one more thing about best Thank comment you. though, about um, FMS and, and timely purchase of items, because we've run into that with um, people who have a short window to register for a particular class they're trying to take or um, a particular group they're trying to join. And just like how you ask um, independent facilitators questions, right? It's the same thing with the FMSs. Ask those questions. If you know you're gonna be purchasing something with a time sensitive window, ask your FMS how quickly it takes um, them to respond to your request and make that purchase because we have run into that. And that's how we have landed into kind of what Judy just described, getting that person um, who not only helps you integrate into the community, but helps you access those services and in return will maybe purchase that ticket. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Just um, can I just add on to that really quickly? Um, just make sure if you're going to do that, if someone is going to be paid for providing a service and for making, making purchases pursuant to that service on your behalf, that that is stated on the spending plan um, because you might have issues having a reimbursement um, on the paid out if it's only listed as an hourly service. Mm -hmm. And then also for things like a timely registration. So let's say there's only 30 seats in a class and every time the class opens up within an hour or two, the seats fill up and you really wanna get into that class. Um, you could have the FMS in some cases purchase a gift card to the organization that hosts the class so that you could purchase it yourself in a timely manner. So there are some creative ways to get around that too. Great ideas, thank you. Yeah, and Judy, I just, I just wanted to let you know too, I won at my informal meeting with our COC on uh, getting my, full, my son's full respite budget. That was- Yay! A, I know, so thank you for all your help. So I'm so happy. Um, I'm just going to make a little quick announcement. Um, we've noticed a couple of um, messages in the chat that are disrespectful, disrespectful of our speakers who are volunteering their time to be here. Um, I've already um, requested Ed Herzl, who manages this meeting, that if we see one, if we see you, uh, if we see a person writing a disrespectful message in the chat, you will be removed from SDP Connect. In the year and a half we've been doing this, we have never had this happen before. And now we have several uh, disrespectful um, uh, messages in the chat. So please, uh, nothing personal. I will, I will remove you. I have no problems with that. Um, okay. Uh, okay. So go ahead, Ed, with the next question. I know there's a zillion of great questions here. Certainly, always excellent questions with this group. So I have another question from Lourdes. Uh, should the IF be the lead on fair hearing? And, and there's been some uh, discussion of this in chat, but I'd like to capture it for posterity. So. Well, I know Carla, you went to a fair hearing with a client. Um, so why don't you start yeah. with that? And then if any of the others of you have gone to fair hearing with your clients. So I actually went to fair hearing with four clients. Oh, wow. And so sometimes, you know, you're successful, sometimes you're not. And, you know, there was one particular regional center that said, we're not going to pay for your, your services. Like we're not paying for IFs to go to a fair hearing after like spending like 60 hours. <laughs> per so maybe like, yes, it would be if, if you need that help and you're, you can ask your IF and if the IF agrees, I, I think it's great if they can go with you and support you and help you, like help you like with the laws and like write an opening statement, closing statement and all of that. Uh, but also maybe find out beforehand if that would be covered or, you know. Yeah, so I have great. actually asked DDS about this specific question and they said they were, you know, should, should independent facilitators be paid for advocacy that they do that goes all the way to fair hearing? And the answer was yes. Um, okay. it, 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 was a, it, wasn't a, it wasn't like, yes, they should. It was, look at the directive. The directive says advocacy. Advocacy um, in the Land Treatment Act includes, includes due process. 
So has any of the other um, IFs on this call, this meeting gone to fair hearing with a client yet? Well, Carla, you are clearly the most experienced <laughs> IF here. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, you have to go. You have to go. Like if they deny you, go. Because I mean, don't take a no for an answer. Yeah. And mm -hmm. in the, this case, I mean, yes, we're gonna appeal it and we're gonna, you know, we're gonna go now to fair hearing to ask for yeah. <laughs> the services to be paid, which is unfortunately, uh, fortunate, but is this particular regional center seems to be, you know, a difficult one in that sense. So, but the other ones were fine. So yes, if you need the support, yes, please ask. Thank you, Carla. <laughs> Next question, Ed. Absolutely. Uh, I will just hit this one real quickly because it's a request rather than a question. Maria is asking if uh, independent facilitators on this call who are comfortable with it could put their contact information in the chat. Uh, that would be graciously appreciated. She's not the only one who's asked for it. So just putting that out there. Uh, Let me just add on to that, Ed, that there are lots of independent facilitators on this call who are not part of our speakers. I tried to get sort of a diverse group of folks but that is not the in, the entire universe of people. I see Sandra, I see Janet, I see Tammy. I'm and that's just on my first page of what and Samantha and Talleen. That's just on my very first page, and I have seven pages to scroll through pictures. So please put your contact information in the chat. Um, I know I'm biased, but my feeling is if the independent facilitators are coming to our SDP Connects, it means they're trying to stay on top of what is happening in the self-determination program. And you need to have an independent facilitator who is understanding the latest information because the information is changing on a regular basis. And, and two weeks from now, when we have our next one, it could have changed again. So you want to make sure that you have that you are working with people, like that could be one of your questions. Do you go to the STP Connect? Do, do, although anybody you find here in the chat, the answer will be yes. Okay, um, next question, Ed. Sure, I have from Zoe. Uh, are there any particular trainings you suggest for people who want to become independent facilitators? Um, and Talene has, has dropped uh, Sonny's link in the chat for training. Uh, a lot of people saying that that was very helpful. Any other suggestions from our independent facilitators? No suggestions. This is for training, uh, right? I, I did take yeah. so many of the trainings. Uh, Sunny, including Sunny, Sunny is, is, is amazing. And the good thing with Sunny is, is like, it gives you like, like very detail of everything. And then she also coaches you and, uh, and there is like a whole community that, that she has too, that we can all communicate. And also I took the ones with Disability Voices United, that was great with ASLA, State Council of Developmental Disabilities. Um, so take all of them. The more you take, the more you learn. And ASLA has also one that is very intensive now. And so you can also look into that as well. And I know that ASLA um, also specifically targets um, people who speak languages other than English or serve uh, uh, underserved communities. So um, they are looking right now to, to um, bring in more people for their IF trainings. I, I also know that I, um, some of the regional centers, like I know that North LA Regional Center is gonna be conducting some independent facilitator trainings. So you might be able to get it that way as well. And um, I was I just, Oh, sorry, Sunny. No, <laughs> I was ahead. just gonna add, take as many as you can. Um, you will learn something new every time you go to a different type of training. Um, so you don't, don't, don't necessarily, you can even do multiple trainings simultaneously. Um, everyone's gonna present information differently. Everyone has different experiences to share and different expertise. So um, take whatever training you can is my recommendation. And, and just to kind of build on that, I know Doug put the independent facilitator network in the in the chat. It's a great way to get connected. People advertise trainings. You can network in there. 
Um, and each, you know, self-determination advisory committees have RFPs out there, and some of those RFPs include independent facilitator training as well. Um, so there's there's lots of lots of options, and then just networking, just talking to people who are doing it. Yeah. Thank you for mentioning the independent facilitator network. So independent facilitators have organized their own network and they meet once a month. Um, they also have a Slack, what is it? Slack platform, Slack something, I don't Slack page. I don't even know what you call the Slack, but they have a Slack. Um, and and um, anybody can join the Slack. I've joined the Slack. I don't completely understand what I'm supposed to be doing on the Slack, but I've joined the Slack. Um, and every once in a while, I'll throw something in there. Um, so that's another question when you're looking at independent facilitators is, are you part of the independent facilitator network and, and what other independent facilitators have you worked with? I mean, these are, these are important ways for, for you to get a sense of, of kind of the kind of person you'd want to hire. Judy, can I say something about new independent facilitators yes. that are there that are taking classes and maybe feel a little bit, uh, um, you know, insecure to start that just do it because we need you like people need you and just you know just start maybe start with your friend with someone that you feel comfortable with someone that that she trusts you that she that that person knows you that you know them you know their family and then after you do that first one believe me it's like okay now you get it and you can continue so just mm -hmm. just start that's, <laughs> great. that's great go ahead ed Next question we have from an anonymous question asker. When did when did the fact that the parent who is an IHSS provider for a child uh, cannot be an IF, when did that become part of the SDP guideline? And is that in all regional centers? It never became part of an SDP guideline or directive. What I can tell you is that um, the some regional center, I don't know which one, asked DDS for, asked DDS a question and they got an email in response saying that. And the regional centers, they meet all the time and they all, and they all shared that information with the other regional centers and all of a sudden it became policy, even though it was the answer to one question. So it's, it's, um, it's very, very, um, it's very frustrating that, that this is what has become policy. Very, very frustrating. Thank you, Judy. I have another question from Christina and Johnny. Uh, if someone has significant communication needs and is unable to easily um, express answers to questions, especially with a person-centered planning process, what would you suggest that person look for in an independent facilitator? Who wants to take that? Sunny? Um, we work with um, people with all sorts of modes of communication, um, including many who are non-speaking, um, many who use AAC. And um, I think the most important thing is that you have to be creative. You have to um, be confident enough in yourself as an IF or the IF has to have a degree of confidence to be able to say, let's try it this way and to work with, with you to figure that out. Um, we often, when we start with someone who, um, you know, has, has a non, non-traditional type, you know, communication style, um, we might say, we don't know how we're going to do the PCP when we first start working with you. Let's do pre-planning. We need to get to know each other. We need to understand how you operate. Uh, we need to understand who is in your life and what works for you. And then we're going to figure out how to do the PCP because it might not look like a big group meeting. And it might not look like asking questions and getting answers. It might look like something totally different. And so you have to be flexible or you, you want an IF who will be flexible and who um, will take a really person-centered. It's not just the language in the plan that's person-centered. It's the whole process has to be person-centered, including how you go about it. And so that's what I would look for um, in an IF is someone who can say to you, 
let's figure out how we can get the information that we want to put in your plan in a way that is really going to work for you. Great. Um, I have a question in our, from our Facebook page for Doug um, from Sally Milano. Doug, as an SLS provider, can you actually take part in the self-determination program? Should we look to help with providers that we have had that have understood my son? A great question, Sally. It is a great question, Sally, and say hello to your son for me and hello to you. Yes, you can, um, uh, anything that you can do in the traditional system, you can do in self-determination if you're willing and uh, I've got a whole other speech of why providers ought to be willing to do that. Um, but you could also, um, you could do your own thing, Sally, with uh, with your son and um, without using a provider, but put together what's essentially supported living. Thank you. Um, nice to hear from you. So somebody in, in the... Um, Facebook page asked if we could put the link of the Slack, um, which I just did. That is, okay. So that is, the, oh no, I put a different link. I put the link to this meeting. I got it, Judy, don't worry about okay, it. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't know why that cut and paste is wrong. Okay. Um, okay, go ahead, uh, another, another question. Sure thing, Facebook, you will have to wait for the link until Judy answers this next question. Uh, Lynn asks, how, I like this question. How did people in the pilot program overcome their obstacles and how come the self-determination program is so complicated now? That is a million dollar question. I got the, I got the Slack link in Facebook. I just copied and pasted the wrong link. Um, yeah, that is the million dollar question. Connie Lapin, why is it so complicated? Connie Lapin actually made up a word for it called bureaucratization. We don't actually think that's a real word, but it is the bureaucratization of the self-determination program. And for those of you who are around during the pilot project, um, you would know that it was a whole lot less complicated during the pilot. Um, part of the reason why it is more complicated than the pilot is because the people in the pilot never were receiving federal funds. And once you get federal funds, it becomes a little bit more complicated. But I also believe that it is, it is more complicated on an, very intentionally. And I'm sure that Connie or Harvey are gonna add to that. Go ahead. Yeah, well, it's, I, I made up a word called bureaucratization. And it's like, people have to justify their jobs so they have to make it complicated and have you jump through more hoops. One of the reasons we love self-determination is that we didn't have to check boxes anymore. And now they're back to making us check boxes. It's, it's very demoralizing and we have to fight it. And uh, Judy has been an, un, an amazing advocate for us. And we're very lucky to have her in, in, in this forum. I don't know if Harvey wants Judy, to say something. This is called the sin of omission from the department. Mm -hmm. Meaning with the lack of direction, it's a free for all out there. Everybody's doing their own thing, and most of them don't know really what this standard of self-determination. The customer is in charge. That's the bottom line. That's very threatening. I, I know I don't want to go back to that, but it's a paradigm shift. It's like we're in charge, and we have a char in charge of our lives, people with disabilities and or their family. So thank yeah, you for yeah. letting us speak. But you want to know something? We ain't going away. Yeah, yeah we're here, we're still here, here, and we're 82 and 84. So just hope that we live forever. Have to look forever. Yeah, you have to live forever. Um, Doug, go ahead. Well, I was also, I think it's important to remember that it's new and that regional centers haven't been audited yet for their work. And, um, and there's, there's a lot of caution that I think is gonna take a while to work through. Um, we and, and um, Dusty and, and Cindy, I went through this with them. Um, it took a while to build a culture of self-determination in the pilots. And, um, and so I think now we have to do that statewide. So I, I'm hopeful that um, bureaucratization aside and all of these other issues, and I never disagree with Connie and I kiss your ring now. 
Um, <laughs> but I, I, I do think that once we understand why it can be easy and why that's what we wanted from it in the first place, um, it will get easier. That's, that's my naive hope. Yeah, I hope you're right. Jeez, I hope you're right. Jan, you wanted to say something? Oh, wait, hold on. Let me get you unmuted. There we go. Unmute. There we go. Did that work? I'm on my phone. I'm never on my phone, but I kept cutting out. I think what we're seeing at one regional center is that none of the staff have every service coordinator we work with has not done self-determination before. I'd say 100% for me with every single one. That's about 30, mm. I think, so far. And so... And they're having to present the person center plan and budget that they don't really know how to do in the first place to their boss's boss. So it's just kind of back and forth. And so I get things every day that I'm trying to fix that, that Judy tells us <laughs> is not our job. <laughs> we shouldn't have to fix that budget um, and find the right service codes and things like that. But we're doing all of it. Yeah. And I think it's just because it's the first, you know, the first time they've ever done it. And we're just trying to help them through it. You know, and then the next one is new too. And it's just, and they, we've asked if they would have a committee or someone we would have that had more training and understanding of self-determination. And they said, no. Hmm. And that was with the state council. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, so we're getting close to the end and there's a couple of announcements I just wanna make. And if we have time, we'll take another question. Thank you, Jan. By the way, Jan's a great independent facilitator in the Inland Empire and at IRC, and we need lots of independent facilitators out there. Um, so yeah, I think she put her stuff, her information in the chat. Um, I just wanna let folks know that we're back to the every other week cycle of, the, of SDP Connect. Literally, just because DVU has just a lot of stuff on its plate, and it's not because we don't think that there should be a weekly one, but it is just our, our limited capacity. Um, for example, next week, we are doing a press conference to free Britney Spears. So these are all the different kinds of things that we work on, people. Celebrities everywhere. Not, not that I'm actually ever going to meet Britney Spears, but we are we are working with the Free Britney movement, and we're we're working on a, on a press conference. So we just have a lot of stuff going on, so we can't be here every week. Um, so the next one will be October sixth. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say is that um, next week. Um, Molly Kennedy and I are delivering a training um, for the participants and families at East LA Regional Center. Um, we're doing a training on the kinds of services and supports you can look for in the self-determination program. And we're delivering it with Regional Center staff, the amazing Liz Harrell. Um, and every it's open to the public. So even if you're not at East LA Regional Center, I strongly recommend it should be on ELARC's website. Um, the reason I recommend it is because Liz Harrell is just like the best in the entire state as far as staff members concerned of a regional center, very, very experienced um, in the self-determination program. So just hearing from her um, on top of the, the presentation we're gonna give. And then if any of you actually care about Britney Spears becoming free, um, there is a big rally on the 29th at 1.30 p.m. in front of the Stanley Moss Courthouse in Los Angeles. If you want to see People Magazine and this and, and every single kind of gossip column in National Enquirer, they're all going to be there. But also there will be very, very passionate um, advocates for conservatorship reform, which is what we are. So I'm hoping that you all will participate in that. Um, also, the final thing is, please, 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 if you think that subminimum wage set pennies per hour is, is wrong, please, we encourage you to send an email, a letter to the governor, um, because he is making decisions today um, and tomorrow, and he must make a decision whether to sign or veto the bill by October 10th. Um, so we have to keep up the pressure on him because he is getting pressure um, on in the other direction from too many people in our community, which is Highly, highly disappointing. Um, so I just want to thank all of our incredible, incredible um, presenters today, um, including the inimitable Doug Pascover, Sonny Chernes, Tracy Evanson, Dusty Beavers, Carla Lehman, um, as well as Molly Kennedy, 
Um, just want to let everybody know um, that um, our incredible Ed Herzl that you all are familiar with has just gotten a promotion. She is now going to be the um, our, our communications and development coordinator, but we got her to agree to continue to be at STP Connect because she kind of has a cult following. So, um, so you will continue to see Ed, but you will see her less of her um, in other places because she has a whole set of new responsibilities like raising us more money. So, um, so thank you all for joining us today and we will see you all in two weeks unless you're gonna try to free Brittany. So take care everybody, bye. <laughs>